Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning and uh, welcome. Let's pray and let's continue with our study in the Book of Acts. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, another day that we could uh, spend time in your word. And Lord, as we um, learn, Father God, about uh, the work of the Holy Spirit through your people in the book of Acts, we ask, Lord, that you will inspire our hearts, that, Lord, we too, Lord, will uh, manifest, Lord, um, an amazing work of your, your spirit, Father God. And Lord, um, in our time, in our generation, Father God, may your name be lifted up, may it be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let me uh, quickly summarize some of the key highlights from last class. Uh, we said that the book of Acts is set between AD 30 and AD 70. We also said that um, the gospel went out from Jerusalem to the neighboring regions and then into uh, other parts of uh, uh, the the world so in the book of acts itself we will see that the asia minor region is covered and uh, some parts of europe and finally paul will get to go to rome he wanted to go further to spain but he was unable to do that so till rome is where he reaches uh, and we also said that the book is authored by Luke, who is a believer, who is a historian. He is a, a writer and also a physician. So he has written the Gospel of Luke as well as the account of the book of Acts. We see that the style of writing in the book of Acts is more of a narrative uh, style where he shares how the entire story unfolded from the time Jesus ascended uh, to when the church, early church was birthed and uh, the, the work of God you know, began to happen in the regions. We see how the focus uh, goes particularly to Apostle Paul somewhere uh, towards Acts chapter 11. And then the rest of the book of Acts covers um, in detail the life of Apostle Paul. Uh, and later, we, we also said that uh, the entire book can be divided, uh, you know, over a, like in terms of the time duration. For us, <coughs> we may find a little bit of a difference when we compare you know, different commentaries, but we go by one particular timeline that we have established. So the first uh, eight years is Acts chapter one to Acts chapter seven. So what is happening in the first eight years? Basically, it's the birth of the early church and uh, it's the growth of the early church and how the people start to go to the nearby regions. Now, uh, after Acts chapter eight, uh, Acts chapter 8, uh, we have the next 10 years unfolding. So the next 10 years is, uh, you know, the multiplying of the Church of Jerusalem. So the whole focus till Acts chapter 7 is Church of Jerusalem only. Yeah, people are rising up over there. Uh, and actually, yeah, they, they're not stepping out. Only in Acts chapter 8 it starts when um, Philip goes to Samaria. So till Acts chapter 7, focus is zooming in on Jerusalem. Now, Acts chapter 8 onwards, they're going out. So starts from Samaria. And, uh, you know, then it'll continue. Paul comes into the picture and then they will uh, kind of start off to move to other regions. So Acts chapter 8 to Acts chapter 12 is the next 10 years when you see the volunteers rising up and uh, uh, the establishing of other churches. Now from Acts chapter 13 is the next 20 years and we will see till the end of the book of Acts it's about Paul and his missionary journeys like all about him from Acts chapter 13. So it's some we are dividing it something like eight years 10 years and 20 years, so roughly 40 years of the 
book of acts where the maximum focus is on apostle paul from acts 13 all right uh, we started off with acts chapter 1 and uh, uh, we explained that it seems to have been written to a man by the name of Theophilus, uh, which is a common Roman name. And he could have been a believer in Christ and also a, a high ranking official. And maybe, you know, uh, Luke wanted to write to him as a, um, as a legal document about the life of Paul to prove that Paul is innocent. So that could have been one of the reasons why it was written to Theophilus. And that's what uh, some of the commentators say. And then we saw how the Lord Jesus was with the uh, disciples for 40 days. After his resurrection, he was there for 40 days. And we said that the life of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, uh, it's historical. It's not a mythology. Uh, there are extra biblical accounts also that talk about uh, the life of this man called Jesus. Now here, we're talking about the resurrected Christ living for 40 days with the disciples. And with many infallible proofs, he proved that he is Jesus. People saw him being crucified, but people also saw him alive and ministering to the disciples. So that's amazing. That means the resurrection of Jesus is real. And we have a passage in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 6 that says that about 500 people saw him alive, resurrected Jesus. So it's historical. Yep, it happened. Uh, and uh, it's not you know, some supposition by, uh, you know, a person who wanted to propagate uh, a, a certain faith. No, it's historical. This has happened. And we see this in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. Then we talked about how Jesus preached regarding the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. Uh, so that tells us, even for the resurrected Jesus, this subject was important. He could have spoken anything that he wanted, but he chose to speak about the kingdom of God. So what the importance of the kingdom of God is and how today we can preach about the kingdom of God. You know, we could say that, oh, the world is waiting to hear a new message. We need to preach a new message. Otherwise, people will not come to church. Don't worry about it. How did Jesus preach? You know, what, what are the uh, uh, important themes on his heart? Uh, and today, those same themes are relevant. Uh, we can preach the same thing. Jesus was preaching about the kingdom of God while he was ministering. Once he's resurrected, he's again preaching about the kingdom of God, Okay, about the rule and reign uh, of uh, the kingdom. And we know that whenever he did signs, wonders, and miracles, he said, hey, the kingdom of God is here. And when he told his disciples, you go preach. You do the signs, wonders, and miracles. He told them, you take the kingdom with you wherever you go. This is the message of the kingdom. For those 40 days when he's with the disciples, he's strengthening them once again in the theme of the kingdom of God. And, um, uh, you know, he's establishing them in that truth. And then we spoke about the great promise In Acts 1 verse 5, he tells them, uh, you need to wait. You need to wait for the promise that has been spoken to you about. Can someone quickly read it out for us, please? Acts chapter 1 verse 5 and verse 8. These are all very like, these are foundational scriptures. Acts chapter 1? Yes. Verse 5 and then verse 8. For John truly baptized with the water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be the witnesses to me 
in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Okay, so uh, thank you, Nikhil. So here, uh, Jesus is telling them that not many days from now, what is going to happen? Very clear cut. You're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Are these people born again? Are the disciples born again? Is that a yes or a no? No? Okay, if you say no, why? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Holy Spirit baptism has not yet happened. Okay, even before Jesus died and rose also, they believed in Jesus. So were they born again? Before Jesus dies, how can they be born again? Are they born? Are the disciples born again or not? No. Okay. No worries. Anyway, uh, that's. Uh, <laughs> what you feel right so see there is a scripture john chapter 20 john chapter 20 verse 22 and 23 i'll read it for us it says and uh, when he had said this he breathed on them and said to them receive the holy spirit if you forgive the sins of any they are forgiven them if you retain the sins of any they are retain so when is this happening this is happening after the resurrection of jesus you know after this then thomas comes and then he says okay show me i want to see your hand and all so jesus is already risen before jesus was risen he has not completed the work of redemption that's the fulfillment right he'll hang he'll uh, die on the cross all that has to happen then only salvation is given to mankind so after he is uh, risen, he tells the disciples, John chapter 20, verse 22, receive the Spirit. He breathes on them. Receive the Spirit. Now we all know being born again, it's a work of regeneration of the Holy Spirit inside us. Salvation for salvation, we need the Holy Spirit. Anyone who is born again has the Holy Spirit, right? So that was the first time the Holy Spirit came to live inside them. What does that tell us? They were born again at that point. John 20, 22, they were born again. Okay. Now to the born again believers, Jesus is saying, wait, you will receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So this is another experience. Do they have the Holy Spirit already? Yes. But there is something else called as the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is also for the believer. And Jesus is saying, not many days from now, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So these born again believers needed to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And what is the point of receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit? We can be a powerful witness. I think I told us last time that word witness there, the Greek word martus, which means being a martyr or being fully like sold out, sold out for Christ. So you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. So why Holy Spirit baptism? It makes me, it makes us a powerful witness. Can we be a witness? Without baptism in the Holy Spirit, yes. I think we tried explaining that last time and said we can do some, you know, work to a certain extent without power. But when there is power, we talked about electrical gadgets, how there is power and they can do a much stronger and mighty work. Same way, when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, we can be a powerful witness. Witness to how many people? It says, Jerusalem meaning where I am, my family, my neighbors, uh, Judea, Samaria, neighboring my circle of influence, 
and even to the ends of the earth. So a powerful witness. If a believer wants to be a powerful witness, what does the believer need? Baptism in the Holy Spirit. Okay, any questions? Any? Yeah? Yes. Uh, so regarding that, um, huh. breathe, he, they receive the Holy Spirit. Yes. So like on the upper room, on the people, they waited. Yeah. They all got born again. Uh, so my assumption is, see, uh, I, I believe that they are born again. Because without being born again, like you can't really receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Because it's like the uh, next or it comes after being born again. So if they receive the Holy Spirit, the only answer is they were born again. Without that, you can't. An unbeliever cannot be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yeah, any other question? Yes, please. Just a little doubt regarding this only, ma'am. Yeah. Like when uh, Paul uh, ministered to unbelievers. Right. So when he prayed on, the, on that time, because they're unbelievers, but uh, they speak in tongues, mm -hmm. right? So they, they, uh, they don't have the Holy Spirit, but how it's possible then? Okay, Paul, when he ministers to unbelievers, they speak in tongues, is it? Yeah. So uh, actually, Chira, if you look at the the um, uh, accounts of Paul's ministry, uh, we don't see unbelievers ever praying in tongues. We don't. Like Acts chapter 19 also, when he comes and he speaks to uh, certain people who know about God, they are believers. But they don't know about Holy Spirit. They say, we've not heard of anything like the Holy Spirit. They are believers and he prays for them. Now, there is one um, uh, situation in Acts chapter 10, where Peter goes to the house of Cornelius and he preaches about Christ. So while he is preaching, that family, they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Nobody goes and touches and prays for them. But what we recognize is when Peter was preaching, They've already accepted Christ. That's why they were able to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is this promise is only to the believer. Unbeliever cannot be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It that promise is not uh, for the unbeliever. Yeah. So it's quite clear that only believers can experience the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So that's what Jesus was saying. You will receive power. And during that time, when Jesus was talking about uh, uh, the Holy Spirit baptism, the disciples ask, you know, God, when are you going to restore? Jesus, when are you going to um, restore this kingdom? Uh, but he says, look, it's not for you to know these times, these seasons. So that also tells us that there are certain plans in the heart of the Father regarding the world and the timings in the world, uh, all of which we don't know and we may never know. Only Father knows the time, isn't it? Scripture also tells us that, like, when, when is this world going to end? Uh, only the Father knows. So what is God saying? God is saying there, <coughs> there are things that are in the knowledge of God. Certain information about times and seasons we may not have and we may not have control right over the things that are taking place now okay you ask god you pray about it but focus on what god is calling you to do so jesus took their attention to you will receive the holy spirit and you will be my witness that is the important part here let's do our part we are here for a reason believer you are here for a reason you serve the lord okay now, we also saw how uh, Jesus went up, he ascended, the same Jesus uh, as, you know, he ascended and the uh, disciples were looking at Jesus. They were so sad that, oh, we thought Jesus is going to restore the kingdom for us and he's gone. Now, what to do? You know, so that was their uh, sadness. They were looking at Jesus being taken up into heaven. I don't know what they were expecting because when Jesus was there, he was telling them, I'll be crucified, I'll be crucified. But when it actually happened, they were quite shocked. You know, Peter ran away. He denied Jesus. Now, when Jesus has told them, he'll go back to the Father, I'll go back to the Father. 
But finally, when he's being taken up, their heart must have had a lot of sadness that, what are we going to do now, Jesus? You're going away. So they were looking, they were gazing at Jesus. And, uh, you know, a cloud came, received him out of their sight. And that, that's what we are told here. Uh, in verse 10, they looked steadfastly towards heaven, meaning they could not uh, bring their eyes down. They are wondering about many things. At that time, you find that there were uh, most likely angels. Two men stood by them in white clothes, angels. They stood by them and said, the same way, the same Jesus, as you see him being taken up, he is going to come back. He's going to come back. So what is this promise? What is this uh, promise for us? This promise is the promise of the second coming. The same Jesus. Where is he now? He's at the right hand of the Father. He's going to come back. No other Jesus. The same Jesus is going to come back. So that's the promise or assurance that God gave through the angels to the disciples and said, be comforted. He's going to come back. You've got to do your part now. So following this, you know, they go to uh, this place called as the upper room and uh, they gather together there. They gather together there and uh, they all continue in prayer. Verse 14 is a very important verse regarding the, the uh, family of believers or the brethren. What is that? It, it, they say uh, they continued in one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So now there are a good number of people, not just the 12. Along with the 11, we should say 11 because Judas is not there, there are others. Mary, the mother of Jesus, did she believe in Jesus? Did Mary believe in Jesus as the Messiah? Yes, she did. Okay. What about the brothers, the brothers of Jesus? That's right. When he was alive, they didn't believe. But after the resurrection, they have also become disciples of Jesus. So they're all gathered together. And the point is, the community of believers was a praying community. Okay. So uh, that's the key. Prayer, prayer, praying, believing community. They were in one accord, one accord. Okay, uh, what is one accord? Is it the the car, <laughs> the accord car? No. <laughs> so it one accord is oneness of heart, oneness of heart. So a uh, believing community with oneness of heart. That's what they practiced in those days, and that's what we need in our times to be a powerful uh, community for God. So that's the highlight. How did? Uh, how could God work so mightily through them? Because they were believing people and they were people in agreement as far as prayer was concerned. So they were in one accord. And this time around, the brothers were also there. One thing was missing when they gathered this time. And that is, uh, there is a disciple less. So they have to select a disciple. Now look at this. Peter. Verse 15, it says, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. There were 120. So Luke gives us a count, right? And then he said, look, uh, God's word, scripture has to be fulfilled concerning Judas. Uh, that, uh, you know, now he's not there, but we need another person in his place. So we have to do a selection to have the 12th person. Think about all this. Who is this Peter? Ah, fisherman, he was with Jesus. What was his experience when Jesus was under trial? Denied. Right? Denied Jesus. He ran away. Uh, now, after the resurrection, after the resurrection, after the ascension, right? It's had an effect on him. What is that effect? You know. He was, yeah, he became bold. Why he became bold? Because he already believed that Jesus is the Messiah, but now he, ha he has experienced it in powerful ways. He experienced the resurrection and the ascension also. 
and uh, now that same peter he's become so bold you remember jesus said you will be like cephas you will be the rock peter but at that time was he the rock no he was not the rock but now something has changed in him and uh, we don't know whether you know jesus told him you take up leadership whatever but it's like instantaneous there is a need something has to be done and peter stood up it says so god called him for that leadership but this is the moment the moment has come we don't know why how but he takes leadership you know he just takes leadership there and he says okay we have to fulfill the word of god scripture one person is missing we need 12 disciples come on let's find the uh, 12th disciple so how do they do this how do they do this very interesting there are two people who are proposed in verse 23 they proposed joseph called barsabas who was uh, whose surname was uh, justice and matthias and they prayed and said you o lord who know the hearts of all show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place and they cast their lots and the lot fell on matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles okay so for the fulfillment of scripture they have to select the 12 disciple but think about this they are depending on god they didn't just select okay who is the most talented who is the most uh, you know whatever tallest or who speaks very well we'll choose you no they prayed they prayed it says and uh, they prayed they asked god god you know people's hearts you show us whom have you chosen to be the uh, 12th right and there were two people who are these two people if we read a little bit about their history we'll see that they were also with jesus for a long time we keep reading about 12 12 disciples right but there were others also who were following jesus for those 3 three, three and a half years so it is likely that they proposed these names joseph and matthias because they must have been with jesus for maybe roughly those 3 years so they knew the teachings of jesus they knew the life of jesus so they were not selecting some random people they selected like people who had good testimony and at the same time they pray and they say god how can we select and one thing they do which i don't think we should do anymore that is they cast lots you know it's like the jona case where they want to throw somebody in uh, the water and so they cast lots the name comes jona okay take him throw him so should we cast lots today is that a biblical thing to do right now to select or okay god you know should i go to bible college or not ah go to bible college whom should i marry okay marry this person is is that a wise way of of selecting god's choice yeah because you see till acts 1 uh, they already had the holy spirit they could have depended on the guidance of the holy spirit uh, but they didn't because it's coming from the old testament practice but we'll see from acts 2 no things will change because baptism in the holy spirit prophecy all that's happening so there's no need to cast lots anymore there is a ministry of the holy spirit all of us must have could, would have studied in first year one of the ministries of the holy spirit is guidance guidance so you can depend on the holy spirit when we can depend on the holy spirit casting lots is not something to be done anymore okay so let's move on we now come to acts chapter 2 so they have selected a person but they are still waiting what is this upper room upper room uh, apparently it was a place near the temple and uh, uh, it's not necessarily how we imagine right like oh on the first floor they are there but it was just called the upper room there was a huge room uh, where all the disciples were waiting in prayer um, and now in acts chapter to uh, this setting we have to understand what what is happening in jerusalem 
that was the festival of Pentecost. Okay, 50 days uh, from the feast, exactly 50 days from the feast of the first fruits is the feast of Pentecost. So during Pentecost, what would happen is that people from all over would come to Jerusalem to celebrate it and to worship in the temple. So devout Jews would come. It is said that on a normal day, the uh, population of Jerusalem would be a uh, 100,000 people. But during the Feast of Pentecost, it used to get, become five times. It would become 500,000. So that gives us the understanding that there were a lot of visitors, a lot of visitors in Jerusalem, people from many different parts of uh, the region, you know, maybe even other countries, devout Jews, they all came to worship and celebrate. So at this point, there are these 120 people in the upper room uh, and uh, something unusual takes place. And you know, the that text of Acts chapter 2, uh, we can never forget the impact of those words. Uh, let's go to it. When the day of Pentecost had come, had fully come, they were all, again, what does it say? With one accord in one place. Is it possible to be without one accord in one place? That's also possible, but thank God they were with one accord in one place. Okay, so praying, praying community. They are praying, they are seeking God. Why are they doing it? Jesus told them. Wait, not many days from now, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So you wait. Now, verse 2, that's that wonderful verse. And suddenly, and suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were, they were seated. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And suddenly, is it really a suddenly? Mm. Yeah, it is a suddenly, but it's not a suddenly also because. Jesus already told them not many days from now. It could have happened anytime. Anytime. Uh, but it happened at that point. Maybe they didn't expect it at that point. They must have thought, okay, I need to pray for one more day. Or we don't know what they were thinking. But you see, the suddenlies of God come like that. When God gives a promise, we are holding on to the promise. We are praying for the promise. And uh, we also don't realize. Suddenly, suddenly it happens. And we're like, wow, how did this happen? And how did this happen now? But it's God's time. That suddenly is God's time. We've got to wait for the suddenly. Now, what if they didn't wait for the suddenly? If they would have prayed, how much time God is taking? You know, I'm tired. I'm tired of praying. Um, let's stop. Let's not pray. Had they stopped, and suddenly would not have happened. So thank God for their obedience. Thank God for their prayerful posture. And suddenly happened. Okay. Suddenly this happened. So they had an experience. It talks about an experience. What is that experience? The first time that people were filled with the Holy Spirit, a sound from heaven came. Like a rushing mighty wind. We can only imagine. Just imagine that day. Okay, one rushing mighty wind came and uh, uh, it's coming from heaven and it filled the whole house. The whole house is experiencing it. Uh, and then there are tongues of fire, divided tongues as of fire on the people and they're all speaking in tongues. They're filled with the Holy Spirit and they're speaking in tongues. So uh, it's, a, it's a scene that we can only picture how it would have been. Now, does it always happen like this when we are filled with the Holy Spirit now? 
not necessary not necessary the first time when god poured out his spirit to baptize his people this was the way in which he did it see god is a god who is creative and uh, you know he has his own way of working so every time for us to uh, hope that yeah this is exactly how god is going to work it need not be it need not he can work whichever way he wants as far as the baptism in the holy spirit is concerned on the first day there was sound there was an experience but it need not be today but we can still be filled with the holy spirit now many people look for the spectacular meaning it's got to be exciting it's got to be dramatic then i'll believe then it's the holy spirit if something happens quietly ah it's not the holy spirit you know acts chapter 2 how the sound came from heaven rushing mighty wind nothing came don't worry on that day it came but it need, need not be like that every time but we can still be filled with the holy spirit and when they were filled with the holy spirit what happened they started speaking in tongues they started speaking in tongues uh how did they get that language it says that spirit gave them utterance holy spirit gave them the words so they those are not their words which they are trained in and they start speaking so when this happens uh we already know that there are many visitors in jerusalem they all take notice there was a big sound so we we can assume that they heard uh, probably a big sound and then there's this noise coming from upper room 120 people speaking in tongues loudly it was noisy it was noisy so they all must have rushed to this place and they were confused they were looking at all these people and they felt like you know they were speaking in their own language their own language you know there is a um, uh, uh, like at least later you see there are people listed out there are the parthians the medes the elamites um, you know uh, people from uh, mesopotamia judea cappadocia pontus asia so i'm just reading out the list of people at least 15 different language groups 15 different language groups they are all in jerusalem and they heard this noise they've come near the upper room and you know what the scripture says they are hearing them each in their own language in which we were born verse 7 how is it possible here are people they are all not very learned not very uh, exposed to you know culture literature well traveled no just disciples of jesus many of them galileans they are filled with the holy spirit and verse 7 says the audience people from other places at least 15 different language speaking communities are hearing the language their own language so what does this tell us tongues can also be human language it can also be human language right it's heavenly language it can also be human language and people understood it and what what was their reaction you know there are certain words used uh, in uh, acts chapter 2 in verse 7 it says they were all amazed and marveled looking at the galileans galileans how are they speaking our language amazed and marveled right so that was one um, uh, reaction and they were speaking the wonderful works of god what is the second reaction the second reaction is that they mocked them they mocked them so one set of people they were amazed they marveled um, you know they were, were saying how could this happen they are praising god in our own language positive reaction second reaction is mocking is condemning ah so noisy what a noisy crowd of people i think they are drunk right something is wrong with them see how they are behaving today when people are filled with the holy spirit what is the reaction we get 
Similar. Nothing much has changed. People look, they don't understand what is happening. Some of them say, wow, what is happening? You know, if, okay, there's a tongues in their own language or some miracle is taking place, they say, God is at work. God is there among these people. But other people, they say, what they're speaking, what unknown language, they're drunk, mocking. That Acts chapter 2 also, they did the same thing. Reaction is same. Today also, reaction could be the same thing. So uh, we should not be moved by it. Don't, don't get uh, hassled by it. But let God do his work. So when people started mocking, and they started saying, these people are drunk, then, verse 14, Peter stood up. Right? He stood up with the 11, raised his voice, and he started speaking. Again, the leadership ability in Peter. That day, did he know that uh, Holy Spirit is going to be poured out? Not for sure. He knew somewhere around this time, not many days from now, Jesus said, we will be baptized. But that very moment, when it was poured out, Holy Spirit was poured out, somebody has to take the responsibility to explain what is happening. And Peter was called to this. He rose up to the occasion as that leader and he starts to preach his first sermon. First sermon. You know, sometimes it happens like this. You've not prepared your sermon, right? Oh, two more days to Sunday, I'll write my sermon. Today, Holy Spirit, suddenly Holy Spirit is poured out. Now you have to preach what to do now. No iPad, no, you know, nothing. No computer. Three people, thousands of people are standing in front of you and people are looking at you. You have to preach. That was the experience of Peter. Think about it. I don't know how he felt that day, but he preached. He stood up and started preaching. Men of Judea. Okay, and uh, all who dwell in Jerusalem, uh, and he started preaching to them. And he explains to them, these people are not drunk. Okay, as you suppose, this is just the third hour of the day, meaning it was early morning. When you check the timing, according to the Jewish, uh, you know, timing, it was somewhere around 9 a.m. in the morning. So he's asking them, logically, think about it. How can they be drunk? It's morning. Nobody's drunk. And then he starts to point to uh, the prophecy of Joel. Because remember the Jews, the worshipping Jews are there in Jerusalem. So they understand scripture. And it's a really good sermon. If, if you know we read about uh, homiletics, we know we should speak in context what the people understand. These are Jewish people. So he goes by scripture and he starts to quote from the prophecy of Joel. Uh, and he says, look, it was prophesied. God said, right, that he will pour out his spirit in the last days. And uh, that sons and daughters will prophesy. And they will, men will have visions, uh, people will have dreams. And, uh, you know, all of this is going to happen. There's, there'll be signs and wonders. And God is going to do these mighty things among his people. So he's telling the people what is happening in front of you is what was prophesied. Joel, aren't you all like believing Jews? Uh, then aren't you believing that God's promise will come, that he will pour out his spirit? It's happening. It's happening in front of you, right? So he begins to speak about this to the people and look at his boldness. Now in verse 22, he says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. It's roughly been, how long has it been since Jesus was crucified? Like maybe two months, 40 days plus 10 days, like roughly two months. Okay. Was it a... Uh, a big issue in Israel when um, Jerusalem, when Jesus was being crucified. Very, very crazy situation. Peter ran for his life. It's the same Peter. Thousands of people are standing in front of him. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. We already said there was boldness. Boldness is at the next level now. <laughs> like you could, I mean, for our generation, we can say something like, Peter, 
the news is still on television right uh, there are still people making the news viral about jesus being crucified and there's a lot of government opposition don't talk about jesus now you'll get into trouble but look at the boldness of peter he stands up and he says jesus of nazareth he could see jesus there were many jesus that was a common name jesus of nazareth he's pointing to that jesus who was crucified by the authorities and he says man attested by god meaning he is a messiah wow that is bold that is so bold how did peter become so bold the baptism in the holy spirit that's what jesus said you shall receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you holy spirit came upon them peter is getting up no sermon no ready made sermon ready to preach preaching about who no confusion here direct what you see they are not drunk it's the holy spirit remember the prophecy and jesus of nazareth man attested by god meaning god approved jesus it takes boldness to preach about jesus but he had the boldness right and he preached a message that day so i'm just going to stop here there's a lot that we can keep talking right in the depths of the scripture but uh, we can stop here right now and continue from here uh, but notice you know how amazing once the holy spirit was poured out on the people uh, any thoughts uh, that you have that you want to share Okay, anyway, um, maybe we can revisit the same passage, read it and come. Uh, we, we've started with Acts chapter 2 now. We'll see, hopefully in the next class, we will touch on Acts chapter uh, 3. Always read like two extra chapters and come, then it becomes very easy, right? So, um, yeah, Acts chapter 2 as of now, where we have seen the coming of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the manifestation as people speak in tongues, people's reaction, and also the sermon of Peter, the bold first sermon of Peter. Okay, So we will stop at this point and uh, we will pray to close. Um, can one of us please lead in prayer today? Father, we thank you. And once again, we come to your presence. Thank you what we have studied about your word, Lord Jesus. Give us knowledge to understand more about you, Lord. And give us revelation from your word, Jesus. Thank you for teaching. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you, everyone.